What's up, horror fans? Pete here from the Lasser Cast, where we talk about all of your favorite horror movies, horror TV shows, and adaptations of your favorite horror books. In this case, Danny, my co-host over there, who's rocking the uh, Trick or Treat mug, and I are going to be talking about Christopher Pike's book, The Midnight Club, which is about to be adapted into um, a show by Mike Flanagan that's coming out on October 7th. Danny, are you excited to talk about The Midnight Club today? I am. Uh, I, I, I always feel weird saying I read this book when I've, uh, I listened to it on Audible, but screw it. That counts. I read it. Um, I, I read it. I finished it a couple days ago. Uh, it's a real quick read. It was only yes. like five and a half hours on Audible, which after you read The Stand, which is 48 hours on oh. Audible, anything with a single digit uh, oh. goes by super duper fast. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I really enjoyed the book. Um, it's really weird. So we're the same age. Yes. And Christopher Pike got his start writing in the early 80s and became like, I guess... 85 was his debut book, Slumber Party. Uh, the Midnight Club came out in 94. So I feel like we would have been prime age for this type of like YA horror sci-fi fiction. And what's weird is I was a massive R.L. Stein Goosebumps fan mm -hmm. growing up. Mm -hmm. So we're, what is your connection to Christopher Pike or, or his work or even R.L. Stein? Like, what were you reading horror-wise growing up? That is an excellent question. Um, I saw a tweet the other day where someone said that it seems like the boys in middle school read R.L. Stein and the girls read Christopher Pike. My connection to Christopher Pike exists with just this book alone, and that's it. When I was a kid... Um, I picked up a Christopher Pike book where there was a teenage party going on and a guy came with a shotgun and just blew away a bunch of the kids, right? Another teenager did that. And I remember reading that and it bothered me like a lot. I don't know why it bothered me so much. So I actually stopped reading it. I never picked up another Christopher Pike book until today. So um, I've never read any of his books. I am a huge R.L. Stein fan. I've read all the Goosebumps books. I didn't read Fear Street or anything beyond that. I didn't really become like a kind of a mature horror fan until kind of recently. So yeah. um, that that's my experience. What about you? I, I'm very similar. I, th by the way, the story you just described sounds like uh, Spencer wrote it or told it in the Midnight Club, but we'll Agreed. get to that in a few minutes. Um, yes. I, I honestly had never heard of Christopher Pike. He was just a blind spot to me growing up. And maybe it was this like unspoken gender divide. Mm -hmm. Because I was reading Goosebumps like crazy in my fifth grade, like elementary school graduation book uh, at the beginning where it's like, you know, year that you graduate, favorite movie, favorite. My favorite book was Say Cheese and Die, <laughs> which was, I think, the fourth ever Goosebumps book. Uh, and that that was written into my elementary school graduation album. So, like, I grew up loving and like just the covers of the Goosebumps yes. books were so cool. They, it felt like I was reading something that looked like a VHS box from the video store. Yeah. And I do kind of find it very interesting. And then of course, after that, I, I kind of, as I got older, I started to get more into Stephen King and, right. and, and that, but I do kind of find it interesting that here we are, we're talking about like the, the two horror authors of our childhood Mm -hmm. And it's 40 years later and Netflix has basically brought them both back to prominence where you have Christopher Pike's Midnight Club uh, being adapted by Mike Flanagan of all people this year. Last year was the year of R.L. Stein with the Fear Street trilogy. Yes. Uh, it's just kind of like everything is coming full circle. You know, hey, Top Gun Maverick, right? Yeah. Everything from our childhood is new again. Yes. And you know, that's a really good point that we should uh, talk about for one second, too is that the Fear Street trilogy was so, so good. And that was made by someone that was involved with Stranger Things, which is this big Netflix phenomenon. And then uh, this Midnight Club is made by our favorite, you know, Mike Flanagan. And of course he has such a big presence on Netflix. They just released like this commercial kind of like, hey, it's the Flaniverse, right? And um, both properties, I feel like, even though they are based on existing stories, feel very, very 
much like the creators of the Netflix show. It's like this Midnight Club show feels like a Mike Flanagan show just based on the trailers. Yeah. And that Fear Street felt a lot like a Stranger Things type story. Especially with the casting, right? Mm-hmm. Like uh, Charlotte right. watched Fear Street 1994 with me. I, I, And I'm trying to get her to watch the other two. And she was super excited because there's Maya Hawk in the opening scene. And right. then uh, Sadie Sink is in, uh, the second is in... Uh, 19 what is it 78 yeah yeah 78 yeah yeah Yeah. so it's like there's totally a stranger things vibe to that show there's one thing that i think that we should definitely talk about and maybe even focus on for this discussion and that is that when you watch the trailer for midnight club it doesn't look like it syncs up entirely with the book in the book we only have five members of the club and in the show it seems like it has a much bigger cast of kids and And then there are Good and really and really, if you read the book, the Midnight Club is five people, but it's really four because right. one of the one of the five people in there contributes nothing to the storytelling, uh, and then later on you find out a reveal about her that she's not even sick and she ends up leaving and and actually going to getting to carry on her life, and you're like, oh. Uh, and she, she's basically there as kind of like a MacGuffin for the main character. Right. Um, and so, yeah, really, there's only four main characters I- in the entire book. Uh, but, yeah, go ahead. Well, we should point out, too, that this is going to be spoilers for the Midnight Club book. And therefore, there might be spoilers for the Midnight Club show. So we haven't seen the show yet. Uh, you know, it's just speculation about the show. But we're definitely spoiling the book. Uh, so what I was going to say was that. There's obviously more kids in this club in the show. And um, what you did and what I kind of did independently is that we both found out that it's very similar to what Flanagan did with Bly Manor. Do you want to explain that to our viewers? Well, yeah. So uh, he adapted uh, the work of James Joyce to do The Haunting of Bly Manor. But whereas Hill House was like a Shirley Jackson story... Bly Manor was the, the his Netflix series was basically a collection of James Joyce stories that he adapted individually and and worked them into one narrative uh, of Bly Manor. Here, um, I it's funny we both did the same thing. We've been doing this for so long. We like intuitively yeah. did this on our own. Right. We we both looked up the names of the ten episodes of the Midnight Club series that's coming out and we were able to connect them back so i looked at episodes three four six eight and nine that is literally five out of ten that's half the series are named for and i'm going to assume based on other ya books uh, written by christopher pike between 1988 and 1993 uh you have episode three is the wicked heart Episode four is Give Me a Kiss. Episode six is called Witch. Episodes eight and nine are called Road to Nowhere and Eternal Enemy. And those are in, in order 1993, 1988, 1990, and then 93, 93. So obviously he's taking the idea of the Midnight Club. Mike Flanagan is. He wow. has He's taken the concept of kids in a hospice, uh, it, like, you know, y- young adults in a hospice dying who get together at midnight and tell ghost stories, or as they say in the trailer, they make ghosts. Right, right, right. But then he's working in these other Christopher Pike stories to kind of up the scares. Because one of the things that I was kind of shocked when I was listening to the book Mm -hmm. was how almost not a horror story this is. In fact, there's really only one of the characters whose stories are really, I would say, horror in nature. And that's the character of Anya, uh, who is the most sick of all of them. She's the closest to death. And her stories typically always involve the devil, a deal with the devil, some kind of Faustian gamble or Faustian deal, uh, demons. Then you have like one of the kids, Spencer, who we said, you know, this ties back to the story you said you read by Christopher Pike. Everything that he does feels like he's writing Columbine stories where, <laughs> you know, there there's a guy or there's a, a character who decides to take everybody with him when he goes. And 
you know, burn the world as he's going out. Yes. Uh, and then you have the two really main characters. You have the main character, Alanka, and uh, the secondary main character, Kevin, who in the book, their stories are almost these like sprawling romantic epics. Yes. Um, and there's like hints of the supernatural and there's like angels and, you know, there's all sorts of supernatural stuff going on, but there's nothing about their stories that are scary. They're just these long sprawling, almost epic romantic tales of past yeah. lives and, you know, angels giving up their, almost like a, what was that movie with Nicolas Cage and Meg? Oh, Ryan? I thought about that. Absolutely. Right. City of angels. City, city, like, yeah. Kevin's story is very city of angels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then there's like an added, like, twist and and it goes on and and it, so the, i i think what flanagan did was he loved the idea of you have these kids who are dying they're yeah. meeting every night they're telling ghost stories let's let's up the ghost story aspect to it wow. and so there's there's five episodes that as far as i could tell don't have connections to other Pike work. So maybe those are the ones that are closer to um, the the book. Episode two is called The Two Danas. Right. And that is one of yeah, Anya's but... stories about right. a girl named Dana who makes basically a, a Faustian deal with the devil to yes. split her body and mind into two yes. separate characters. Right. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be a great episode. Uh, and Flanagan directs, I think, the first two episodes. And okay. he's written or co-written, I think, almost all of them. Oh, good. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting thing reading this book after watching the trailer and kind of knowing about Mike Flanagan. Because, you know, I even read some of the reviews for this book. And a lot of people were like, oh, well, it makes total sense that Mike Flanagan is directing this. Or, or people actually didn't like this book because they thought it was going to be a scary book because of Christopher Pike. They were sort of let down. But then they're like, oh, but Mike Flanagan's making it, so it makes a lot of sense. So I think there's that idea that Mike Flanagan really knows how to tell an emotional story with horror <laughs> trappings. And I mean, we've talked about that in multiple reviews. Yeah. How like, his stuff can be devoid of horror the horror aspect and still be a good movie, right? So true story. I was, I, I haven't been running as much lately, but the last time I went for a run was about four or five days ago. Mm -hmm. And I was finishing the book. I had about, about 45 minutes left in the book and something happens in the book. I mean, it's about, it's about teenagers in a hospice yeah. with varying degrees of terminal cancer Right. And their stories reflect their their dying. And I'm running and I literally as I'm running, I'm starting to like tear up. And I just oh. thought to myself, oh God, Flanagan is going to destroy me again when I yes. sit down to watch this show. Uh you know, and again, we've talked about it ad nauseum on here with Midnight Mass was just like the epic monologues between the characters about the decisions they make and, and, and death. And there's that, there's that epic scene between Kate Siegel and Zach Guilford. And I think it's episode four of midnight mass where they just sit up and talk to each other. And a lot of people on like social media are like, boy, everybody just talks on this show. And meanwhile, <laughs> I was like hypnotized by yeah, that yeah. scene. <laughs> and I mean, that show was just heart-wrenching throughout. And it's also terrifying because it's about this, like, yeah. in, you know, insane, you know, Salem's Lot-style vampire taking over an entire town. Right, right, uh, right. And then, you know, Bly Manor and, and, and Hill House are about tragic loss of family and and love. And, and it's all this emotional stuff while there's the bent neck lady and... You know, the, all this terrifying imagery going on, and you know, in in Bly Manor, the ghost who drags people into the lake to drown them, and it's just, you know, it, it, there's nobody better at yeah. at making you cry and scaring you at the same time than Flanagan, and I I just couldn't help think, 
you know, you you're you're setting this story in a in a in a child's hospice or nice. like a teen a hospice for teenagers. So you're gonna you're gonna be running that, you know, that emotional train right from the beginning. And uh, yeah. I'm really I'm I'm dreading it, but in a good way, if that makes sense, you know. Right, right, right. And, and yeah, and so it's it's interesting because I I feel like he's gonna mainly focus on the stories, like almost like the kids starting the stories and narrating is probably going to be like the book ends for the actual stories they tell. And the whole episode will be like the stories that they tell. And then there's going to be this through line because over the course of the book, and like we said, we are talking spoilers, you know, some of the characters do die over the course of the book. And so I'm sure that we will have at least one of the major, if not the most heartbreaking death, probably right in the middle of the series. And it'll yeah. keep going on. And since there are uh, multiple characters that are adding to this group, then there'll probably be extra deaths and stuff too. But um, what you have in the actual book itself is you have the, the kids that Danny described before. And then they're, they're all in this Rotterdam home, which is this hospice. And there's this one man who's essentially the head of the house. And he himself had a child who uh, died as well. So, so... Like, that's one of the things that Flanagan does, too, is he has these monologues that Danny mentioned before. And you could have a character just literally just talking about someone that died. And that's what the doctor does at one point. And yeah. uh, that in itself is sad. So um, each character, like Danny said before, has a different form of illness. And um, I thought that we could kind of go in the order of their stories and just kind of briefly talk about the character and the stories they tell. You already kind of touched upon a few of them. But for instance, you mentioned Spence at the beginning of the show, and I think he's going to be kind of compelling for people to watch. Here's a big, big spoiler, but it turns out that Spence doesn't have cancer. He actually has AIDS. And when this book came out in 1994, it was very controversial to have a male character with AIDS, a gay man or a gay boy uh, have AIDS. And he is very bitter with the world. And so all of his stories involve like horrible things happening to people. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, and I'm wondering what you think about this, Danny. His book, his story is about a character, the first one, the very first story we open with is with a shooter at the Eiffel Tower just taking people out. And I feel like in 1994, of course, that would be sensational and over the top and crazy, but we live in a world with constant gun violence and shooters killing people, random people. I wonder <laughs> if Flanagan is going to just gut that story completely and change it into something totally different. What do I'm, you think? I'm, I mean, Pike wrote this obviously 94. So you're on the timeline. That's five years before Columbine. I cannot imagine that they would do a story like that. I mean, if there's somebody who is going to do a story like that tactfully, it's fine again. Right. But I just don't, I, you know, it's not only has it, like you said, it, it's not just Columbine. It's, it's all of these shootings. I mean, it, and, and the one that is described is very similar to the Las Vegas shooting um, that took place a few years ago, because basically Spence's story is, you know, like you said, this guy, is, he's a Vietnam vet in the story. He got scarred from Vietnam. His wife left him. He's angry and he decides to kidnap his ex-girlfriend drag her up to the Eiffel Tower and with a sniper rifle just start shooting people and and like as I'm listening to it I was almost I was really uncomfortable because it's like you know like in 1994 you could have just been like oh crazy guy shooting people oh, oh okay you know that is scary wow now you, now it's like you know you expect to see that on the news instead of as a piece of fiction. So right. I do agree with you. I don't think Spencer's stories are going to translate into episodes. Uh -uh. Um, I'm really interested to see what they do with Alanka and Kevin's stories. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I, because those are the stories to me that feel the least scary, but at the same time, the most Flanagan. <laughs> Good point. You know, okay. especially Kevin's story of Hermie the Angel uh, who just sits in the Louvre and, you know, almost better than Picasso and better than uh, Da Vinci paints these works. 
and he, you know, a woman meets him. They they fall in love. She keeps trying to get him to leave the, the Louvre with her. He says, I can't, I can't. Finally, he falls so much in love with her. He leaves the Louvre and basically becomes a human. And then, long story short, I guess she gets tired of their monotonous life and cheats on him and leaves him. And now you have this fallen angel who's left to live a life of like nothing where, you know, he doesn't even get joy out of painting anymore. But then the story just keeps going in these odd directions. He, 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 he like works at a national park and he's loving his life again, but then he gets, he, he falls and breaks his back. And then he decides for, as a paraplegic, he's going to be, he's going to become a doctor. Uh, and, then, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then he ends up treating the woman who left him, who's dying. And they have this like wonderful moment of catharsis at the end. Right. And it's just like, uh, yeah, it, it, it's just this bizarre story that keeps going. And these characters find all new, uh, you know, ways to continue to interact with each other. And it, it's, it's, it felt like that scene in midnight mass where you have these characters who, while there is scary stuff going on, they're just going to sit there and have this, you know, five minute uncut, you know, dialogue scene about what happens when you die, you know? And it, it's just, I, I, it's, it, I, I, that's the kind of stuff I hope gets put into this uh, series somewhere, you know? Oh, yes. Yeah, I have no doubt that the whole Hermie the Angel story, which is told by Kevin, mm -hmm. I have no doubt that that is going to be in this <clears throat> show. And and Kevin, we should kind of bring up that he has leukemia and he is this very charismatic character. Ilanka, the main character, loves him. And he is very talented. Um, he's like a painter. And I, I believe he was like an athlete and stuff before he had cancer. And he um, has a girlfriend at first in the story. But the girlfriend is healthy and she comes and visits him. Um, but the idea is that Ilanka and Kevin, once you go further into the book and you reach the end, it's that they might potentially be these reincarnated spirits and they just keep cycling. Yeah. Right? And I kind of... I wanted to talk about that particular aspect in one second, but there was one thing that kind of I was thinking about while you were talking, which is that there's elements that are in each of these stories and throughout this book. One element is that there are characters that are happy and content in their relationship, and then they choose to cheat on someone, and then that person walks in and literally catches them in bed with someone else. That happens at least twice in this book. Yeah, in that happens with Anya in her story. Well, in, in her actual life. In her real life, right, good point, good point. And yeah. then it happens to Hermie in Kevin's story. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, I, also, I, I also just want to mention, um, in the sake of time, I just want to mention that one of the key things that these five people come to do in their midnight club um, they they form a pact where and I feel like this is going to be a big part of the show. Okay. Um, they they come up with this pact like look we're all going to die we're we're in a hospice for f sake we we all have terminal diseases we are going to die how do we let the others know what the afterlife is like and they come up with a pact that whoever dies first will like give some type of signal to the rest that they are still there in spirit. Right. And the, the first uh, real moment that you get from this is Anya, who is easily the sickest of all of them. She's the first one to, to die and her belongings are gone the next morning. And nobody really knows what happens to them. And Alanka is like searching almost the entire hospice to find uh, her belongings and she can't and it's almost like you know Anya hid them or you know did something to those belongings to create that uh, you know message to the rest of them that we have you know there is something I'm still here in some way uh, and I feel like that's going to be a big part of the series because that could be you know, we, we see in the, the, the previews, we see a lot of 
you know, ghosts and a lot of haunting is going on. So I feel like that's going to be a big part of like these, the, the characters who die coming back to almost haunt the people that are left behind. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's so much that Flanagan can work with. And it's interesting because like this book seems so different from what I've read about Christopher Pike. And when I did research into this book, there wasn't like the usual quick, oh, here's a breakdown. This is the inspiration. You know, uh, I mean, I go to Wikipedia a lot when I do research for our shows and stuff like that. And there wasn't really an entry about this book. I had to kind of gleam stuff from reviews and things like that. Um, but it's interesting because like with Christopher Pike, I feel like he probably got kind of pigeonholed at one point, like R.L. Stein, to kind of always include certain trappings in each of his books because his readers would come to expect it. And I think that one thing that is so different from his work and like the Goosebump stuff that we read, which is obviously for younger kids, is there's like a lot of like sex and stuff in his books, right? There's like teens having sex. There's no graphic description of sex, but sex does play a big role in this story. You know, mm -hmm. they, people like make love and stuff, right? Um, and then what's interesting about this book too, on two levels, is that there's a lot of description of like ancient times. There's a lot of description of people living in other countries. There's multiple people that are in uh, France at some point. France, right? India, there's a lot of like, um, they even, somebody even asks Alanka, like, how do you know so much about the Vedas? which are the holy books of Hinduism. How do right. you know so much about this? And she's like, oh, well, it's a past life story. So I guess, you know, I, I picked it up along the way. <laughs> you know? Right, right. And, and so like with them going to other countries and this past life stuff, I feel like this is not what Christopher Pike, for me, like Christopher Pike always just kind of seemed like, I know what you did last summer, even though he didn't write that book. <laughs> but like, that's kind of like his thing, like that sort of teenage murder mystery kind of thing and so this seems so different and i wonder if this for him was like a special project that was very different and one of the things i like about this book so much is that you have characters that haven't lost their virginity yet that are like they're, they're gonna die before they can experience life and so they're telling these stories about traveling to other countries and having lovers and stuff. So that's a really interesting dynamic. And I think the show will probably play with that too, of this idea of, yes, I'm dying before I can do anything with my life. This story is making me feel like I can kind of touch that. And then ultimately I'm going to even die before I have the chance to experience it. So real bittersweet stuff. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's in the hands of a master. So um, there was one last thing I also wanted to bring up too, and then I want to hear some more of your thoughts, but like the fact that Alanka and Kevin might be like reincarnated spirits sort of going throughout time, it, it, I'm going to digress and talk about comics for a second, but two superheroes, and we're going to see one of them in Black Adam, Hawkman, um, Hawkman and Hawk Girl have this very convoluted history and origin where essentially they find each other, they fall in love, and then they both are murdered. And then they're reincarnated. And this has been going on since ancient Egypt all the way up until modern times. And so there's like an ancient, there's a Wild West Hawkman and there's like a private eye Hawkman, right? And I just kept thinking about that when I was reading this book. And it made me wonder were there comic book writers that were inspired by Pike? Was Pike himself a comic book writer? And he got some ideas like from that. You know, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, but we'll see. If you guys like my comic book stuff, by the way, me mentioning comics, you can go to my other channel, Comic Books Transformed. But I just kept thinking about, I, I really truly do love that idea of two lovers sort of coming together and then getting killed and having to be reincarnated and finding each other again. I really like that concept. And one of the best parts of that whole concept was that the man in one of the stories, in one of the past life stories, basically says, you've been cursed you have this burden on you. I want to take some of that burden on me. And I'm like, that's one of the most fucking romantic things I've ever heard in my life. You yeah. Know? It's, it, it really was a book that I, I was not prepared for because maybe I went into the book thinking, oh, this is going to be a Mike Flanagan horror series on Netflix. Uh, I can't wait to see, you know, how scary these stories are. And then it's like, with the exception of really like 
two stories. Most of them are, like we said, they're these like sprawling historical romantic epics of fallen angels and, and, and ancient love and, and reincarnation. And you're just like, Oh, this is, this is something very different. And it's set in like the real world horror of a teenage hospice. Like that, there's nothing horror movie about that. That's just horrible. It, you know, you have these <laughs> effectively 16 to 20 year old kids who are sitting around waiting to die. I did love the idea that the doctor, so like in the preview for the series, they make it seem like the kids are sneaking out of their rooms and go and doing the midnight club right in in the show in, in the show in the book the doctor is like look i love that you're doing this here let me give you the nicest room in the 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 building uh let me give you this big gorgeous study and you guys can use that every night at midnight and then he actually talks to the kids about the stories they tell um and you know like, like you said the the doctor in the book he lost a daughter so he he feels a very special connection to these kids and he almost wants, like you could tell he wants to be more included. Like he's actually asked to be, uh, to join them at night and they've told him no. <laughs> so um, I'm really interested to see if Heather Langenkamp is the doctor um, because obviously uh, if you haven't seen the trailer for the show, Nancy Thompson from A Nightmare on Elm Street, the great Heather Langenkamp, is um, she's portrayed to be the head doctor. And I'm really excited to see what role she has. And then you have the Flanna family is all back. Uh, Rahul Kohli is there, Samantha Slyon, Matt Beidel, uh, Zach Guilford, all from, you know, Midnight Mass and Blind Manor and his shows. Uh, they are all back uh, in parts, and which is interesting because in the book, again, there's really only one adult with a name, right. and that's I think Doctor White, right? Doctor yes, White, yes, yeah, yeah. In and now you have obviously you have all the Flanagan's, you know, uh, cast members are back, so you have all these extra adults. So I'm wondering what roles they're going to play. Maybe maybe the hospice is expanded to being a, a full hospice, and maybe okay. there are adults that are dying uh, in there along with the kids. So, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm just, you know, I we both, we give Flanagan a, you know, a free pass to do whatever he wants because we're just that confident that it's going to be fantastic. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what he does with this. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that his uh, Flanagan family is, uh, they're most likely going to be characters in the stories. That, that's my guess, right? Is that that's why there's adults, because there are adult characters in the stories. But uh, you never know. Yeah, it could be a thing where there are adults that are in hospice too. You know, maybe they like stop in, like maybe Roe Cool is using a walker and he stops in. And he's like, oh, I have a story too, children. You know, you never know. But, um, you know, we'll see. The show comes out October 7th. Um, we haven't spoiled the book completely. We sure have covered a lot of it, but it, like Danny said, it's a quick read. I recommend going and finding it. It's on Audible. You can find it on Kindle and stuff. And it's, I think it's very well written. So like, if you're like me and this is your first dive into Christopher Pike, go and hit this up before the show comes out. You still have a chance yeah. to read it. But uh, yeah, Danny and I will start covering uh, uh, Midnight Club when it comes out, which is October 7th. Thursday night. Uh, Thursday starts New York Comic Con and th Thursday night they are having a Midnight Club panel at New York Comic Con and Mike Flanagan is going to be there. <laughs> so I am going to be online hours in advance to get into that panel. Um, I'm, I'm not going to make a scene, but I am going to be very excited to be there. Hopefully if there's a Q&A involved, maybe they'll show the first episode. I'm hoping typically they do things like that. They do. You have an extra Thursday if you want to fly in. Oh, no problem. Yeah. My teacher's <laughs> budget, I'm on it. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so, yeah, if you guys love flying as much as we do, then make sure that you have subscribed to the Lasser cast. And we got a ton of horror content coming to you for the month of October. But we will see you guys real soon.